Welcome into episode 330 of the Skate Podcast. I'm Brandy Felice, joined by Bridget Peru and Scott McLaughlin. It is our first episode post the 4th of July. So Bridget is back from New Hampshire. Scott had a nice weekend locally, and we had development camp for the Bruins. Nikita Zadorov spoke with um, the media at a, at a press availability in person. So Bridget and Scott, before we get into our opening shifts and how the holiday went, I do want to plug quickly that we will be having uh, a mailbag episode later on this week. And if you would like for us to read your questions on the next episode, get us your questions on Twitter or the skate pod email or YouTube um, by, I would say maybe Wednesday afternoon and we'll record likely on Thursday, Friday and get to any of your off season questions so far. Um, but Bridget and Scott, yeah. how was your July weekend? Uh, it was good. First off, we'll just say email skatepod at wei.com at the skate pod on Twitter and uh, WEI YouTube page is where all our videos are. Um, so, yeah, so we'll look at all those for questions. Uh, yeah, my July 4th was good. It started at Warrior. Um, that was the final day of Bruins development camp. So they had they do like some drills and then a, a scrimmage that day, although. The, the scrimmage wasn't a full scrimmage this year. Like in the past, they've done, you know, not like a 60 minute game, but like I think they've done three 10 minute periods. And this year, they actually only did like one 10 minute period of five on five. And then they went back to some like in zone drills and three on three stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's always the best way to start the 4th of July. I think it's what the founding fathers would have wanted. Um, but the, yeah, the, the, rest, the rest of the weekend was good. I did a lot of relaxing by my parents' pool. Um, yeah, just kind of hung around. Nothing crazy. I think uh, what the founding fathers really wanted was us to just hang out on, you know, on a lake, paddleboard, beach, whatever, dock, uh, watch some fireworks, which is what I did. Uh, I I do also though. I Th have FOMO. Thomas Jefferson loved paddleboarding. Oh man. So do I. We got that in common. But uh, <laughs> but I did have FOMO because I I love development camp. I love being there to watch guys that we don't get to see a lot. Uh, and I especially would have liked to see Letourneau. So there's been times where I've gone and I really I really felt like I got a lot out of it. So I'm kind of jealous of Scott in that way. But also at the same time, I had a great weekend. Uh, my cousin got engaged, too. So we had just an absolute crazy week of of you know, celebrating that. And, uh, so I had a good 4th of July week, uh, and I didn't come back with a sunburn. So that's good. Uh, but I do want to hear more about rookie camp from Scott because it is, I, I think it's an interesting uh, time of year, especially when we're in a low, uh, this year, like you said, Brian, uh, in a past episode, we have more to talk about in the off season than we have for a while. So, uh, we'll definitely get into that. Yeah. And yeah, Scott's gonna break down a certain, First of uh, not first overall, but first round draft pick by the Bruins, I think, in a few minutes. But before we get to that, uh, Bridget, why don't we go to you and start off with the opening shifts? Yeah, so uh, I guess this is one that just has been on people's mind because it's a huge piece that technically hasn't been fully put into the puzzle yet for next season, though we know it's on the horizon and it will happen, and that's Jeremy Swayman. So uh, since our last podcast, we got the list of NHLers that will go to arbitration and Jeremy Swim was not on that list. So uh, in, in the whole grand scheme of things, it seems like even though we haven't heard the details of a contract yet, neither side wants to go to arbitration. They won't go to arbitration. The deadline has already come and gone. So it's just us waiting on a final number, a final term but it's going to get done. And obviously we knew it had to get done. Sweeney has said multiple times that it will get done. So uh, people who are kind of freaking out about it, just you don't have to worry. I, it's it's going to get done. Uh, it's just a matter of time at this point. So that's one of the main takeaways from the week is just that, you know, you have your number one goalie. We just don't know the, the contract necessarily, but it, it there will be a contract. Don't don't tell that to sports radio or to fans on Twitter. I'm sorry, but like a lot of times this podcast is just to uh, half of half of it is just to to be like, 
hey, Sports Talk Radio is just kind of inflaming, like stoking <laughs> stoking the fire. And, and we understand it because we work there, but uh, we also know more of the, you know, the, the backstory. Uh, and this is the more accurate version of what's going on, I should say. That's, that's the best way I can put it. Yeah, and I did, I did send out a PSA to, to people on Twitter pretty much saying exactly what Bridget just mentioned. Um, but more importantly, and this is the hard-hitting evidence, is that Swayman was also alongside Brad Marsh and Charlie McAvoy in a PR video that was advertising next season's schedule. And I just don't think that um, that would be happening if uh, a contract wasn't imminent. But um, yeah, definitely some some stuff to talk about with Swayman or, or not so much because Bridges kind of wrapped it all up. It, it, it is a matter of, of when, not if. Um, Scott, do you have any thoughts on Swayman before you're... Your, yeah, he, your, he was also yeah. at at Warrior for one of the days of development camp. He was watching from the bench for a little bit, talking to some of the prospects. Uh, he was on the ice at Warrior again on Monday uh, after Nikita Zadorov met with the media. So he, he's around. Um, and as you said, like he was in that schedule release video, certainly acting like a guy who's very much still a member of the Boston Bruins and plans to be uh, going forward. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get, we'll get more into Swayman and just some of the, the details of kind of what can happen next. And there, cause there is one potential downside to, you know, to, to both sides avoiding arbitration that, that I want to get into. Um, but my opening shift is about development camp and specifically first impressions of Dean Laterno, the Bruins first round pick this year, 25th overall. Um, I, I think from, from my eyes and from talking to people, whether it was Ryan Mujanel or Adam McQuaid, um, who spoke with media at, at development camp, all positive. Um, certainly. I think the thing that really stands out and that everyone said as well is like, he does have really good hands and a really good shot. And like, it's, it's really impressive to see. I think I mentioned in the last episode and because we recorded after the first day of development camp and only briefly touched on it because that was also free agency day. Uh, but it was like, as soon as he got a puck on his stick, it was just so smooth. And it was like, he just had total control in the stick handling drills um, in one-on-one, two-on-one drills, like battle drills, you know, protecting the puck and his shot, you know, from distance as well, because it's a hard shot. But especially from in close, like the way he's able to get the shot off so quickly um, is, is pretty impressive there. You know, it's not, it wasn't all completely 100% positive. Like I think I, I also mentioned the last one, he had a couple little hiccups in some of the, the skating drills, which are really technical in nature. So there's probably some stuff to work on there. Um, I did think he, he lost a couple battle, like true 50, 50 battles where the puck was, up for grabs. There are a couple that he lost that I would imagine he's not going to lose as he bulks up and learns how to better use his size. Um, because I think, I think he is listed at like 216 pounds, but when you're six, seven, like there's clearly still more room to fill out from there. You know, like if you just think of Nikita Zadorov, another guy we're going to talk about this episode, he's six, six, two forty eight, And like, I don't know that the turn of mind, I have to get to 248, but there's probably like comfortably 15 pounds that he can pretty easily put on here over the next couple of years. Um, so, yeah, so those are kind of early takeaways. And I think, you know, we'll get a, into him a little bit more and, and possibly have some other development camp thoughts. Scott mentions Nikita Zadorov, and that's kind of where I want to start. Uh, and it's been a week since the Bruins acquired Zadorov and Elias Lindholm in free agency, namely. They also acquired Max Jones, who I think is another sneaky good ad. And I think Bruins fans are going to really like his compete and his energy and his physicality as well. You add in the addition of um, Mark Kastelik, which was part of the, the Linus Olmark trade, where he's a you know fourth-line guy but brings that that energy, that physicality, that forechecking presence that uh, the Bruins are valuing. You add it all up. I just think these are the Bruins have gone out and added players that are just going to fit right in, and they all fill needs that I think this team lacked uh, a year ago. 
with Lindholm, it's certainly uh, a higher end number one center and uh, and slots everybody in their proper spots down the middle. But as it pertains to Nikita Zadorov, I just feel like for the first time in a while, starting with Zadorov and then even guys like Kostelik and Jones and guys that Bruins already have in McAvoy and Frederick and others, for the first time in a while, I think that this Bruins team has an element of intimidation and fear physically to play against that they haven't had since the days of Zdeno Chara. And even Chara's last couple of years, you know, he was clearly a little bit over the hill, but still a big presence. But I just think teams certainly post Chara have respected Boston and they know that if they want to beat Boston, that they have to outwork them because the Bruins will bring the effort every single night. So teams respected Boston and they knew that they were a hard out, but they never feared them physically. And they certainly weren't intimidated by them physically. And I think that heading into this next season for the first time in maybe five or six years, the Bruins are going to ice a team where opponents will have their heads up and their heads in a swivel, especially if you're forward on the ice against a, McAvoy is a door off pairing, just as an example. I mean, good luck. Like I one of those guys can 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 lay a, a very punishing uh, open ice hit. And so I just wanted to bring this up because we've had a week to kind of mull over some of these additions. And while I think they all fill needs the Bruins desperately had to fill, there's an element of intimidation and fear physically that this Bruins team hasn't had in a while. And I think it's going to be a very welcomed and necessary uh, addition to their uh, team identity. Yeah. And, and, you know, Don Sweeney, when he met with us after the first day of free agency, the first question was like, well, you, you clearly wanted to get bigger. Right. And he, and he kind of danced around and he said, you know, what wasn't really our, our goal to get bigger. Like we were just looking for, the right fit, good, you know, whatever. Um, but they did get bigger, and he did on multiple occasions highlight, you know, like Zadorov's presence he, and and swagger. He mentioned like words like that. He, we've heard him, you know, kind of like the last. I don't know this trade deadline, last off season, last trade deadline talk about creating anxiety on the forecheck. And that was clearly still a focus. And on the other end of the ice, holding up better against the forecheck. He talked about that as, as a key part of Zadora, especially if he were to pair with Charlie McAvoy, you know, um, Sweeney mentioned like McAvoy tends to be back retrieving pucks and take some heavy hits. And, you know, if Zadorov's paired with him, maybe he takes some of that off of him and it's four checkers going in on Zadorov and, they're more like it just bounce off him because a he's big and B he's very physical. He knows how to take hits. So give hits, but also take hits. So yeah, uh, all of that, like you're right. There, there is a clear, in addition to the, to the size that I think everyone's mentioned, there is a clear sort of attitude and, and physicality to these guys. And, and I'm glad you you mentioned Max Jones because I think, you know, we, we got to talk to him last week, um, you know, since the last time we recorded. And he he said that he likes to play like his hair is on fire. Uh, I saw Mark Diver talk, talk to someone and had a good quote about him that said he's a prick on the ice. And that's a good thing. Like that. Yeah. So like there's this clear sort of attitude adjustment that's come that I think this team's going to have, you know, Kastelik is a guy who's not afraid to drop the gloves and brings his own physicality. And um, yeah, like it's, especially as you get, you know, a little further down the lineup, like that's going to be a big part of this team. And, and maybe, you know, we're talking about how this team still has like an opening in the top six. And we've, we discussed that on the last pod, but I don't know, you know, maybe some of your skill guys get a little more freed up if, you have guys that are setting a physical tone like, like that and, and um, you know, causing a little bit of intimidation, anxiety in the opponent, whatever you want to call it. 
Yeah, I'm trying. Uh, my computer is not really uh, cooperating, but I'm try I'm trying to come up with any players that weigh more than Nikita Zadorov that are currently in the NHL, and it, it, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Uh, so he, I mean, he's got to be up there, and I will get it to you as soon as I I can filter it, and my computer lets me. Uh, does Maroon weigh more? He, do you know? He might still. No, he doesn't. No, he weighs like ten pounds oh. less. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't really know if there is a, a player that has more weight to them. And I will, before the end of the podcast, make sure I figure that out. But, uh, in terms of what Brian started out saying, which is, you know, uh, do, do teams fear the Bruins more now that Nikita Zadorov is there? The answer is yes. And that is a big thing that they were looking to add they mentioned at the trade deadline. I think they mentioned last off season. I don't think that they successfully did that in either of those situations, but I think that they did that with this move. So uh, that's, that's a big thing. And you, you got a guy on the back end that can protect some of your higher skilled forwards when he's on the ice. Cause a lot of the times in the past, we've been talking about, you know, who do we got for fighters? Who, who does the team have for fighters that can protect Pasternak or, or, you know, just name your skilled player. Uh, and there's not a lot of fighters. And obviously Maroon uh, left in free agency and and Frederick can fight, but, and Lauka was gone. Like Frederick can fight, but he's not really imposing and you don't really fear him. You just know that he might stick up for his teammates. So uh, I do think that this changes things uh, on how teams game plan for the Bruins. Where, whereas the last two seasons, I think that teams had similar game plans to to try to eliminate you know the top six forward group for Boston um they weren't really worried about dealing with that that physical play um so yeah they got bigger uh in, in Scott you said that that wasn't uh you know that wasn't the the goal but that's absolutely uh was a plus when trying I mean, to add for, 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 for the record I, I think it was the goal and I think I, exactly that's what I, <laughs> that I do think that that's it's kind of like beating around the bush. Like you're saying you want to get tougher. That normally means that you want to get bigger. <laughs> like it, they kind of yeah. go hand in hand. So uh, bigger means you can't get bumped off the puck. Bigger means you're winning those physical battles. Bigger means that your, uh, your checks hurt more. Like there's, there's so much that comes with physicality that comes with size. Yeah. And you know, it's an important distinction as well, because it's not like they had to sacrifice skill to get this size now obviously Matt Grizzlick is a more gifted pure skater than Nikita Zadorov you know what I mean like I'm not that's evident but it's not like the Bruins went out and got Jared Tenorti Jared Tenorti and, and and Pat Maroon where like you're getting size but you're you're giving away like no 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 Nikita Zadorov is a top four defenseman all day in the NHL he can move the puck he can you know make things happen offensively um so it, it, it's Max Jones is a is, is a he Max Jones, I think, is going to remind. Ironically, Chris Ra Chris Wagner also spent time in Anaheim, but I think Max Jones pr provides a little bit of like that style of play that Chris Wagner brought to brought to brought to Boston, where he is just like constantly, you know, hair on fire, like Max Jones himself said. But he's probably a little bit bigger than Chris Wagner and might have a little bit more natural um, uh, skill, although it hasn't really come to fruition at the NHL level all entirely just yet. By the way, I, I'm trying to find the individual numbers, but I, based on elite prospects, I looked up at, uh, teams by average weight uh, in the NHL for the upcoming season, and the Bruins are number one. The Bruins have the, the highest average team weight, uh, 208 pounds on average. Fat guy winner if, coming in. <laughs> so I'm just saying like they are technically the biggest team in the league as of right now coming into next season. And that's with losing Pat Maroon. That's with losing. Exactly. By the way, I, did, I looked up that there was one player listed as heavier than Zadora. Um, and who is you it? Guys probably, you guys probably won't guess it, but uh, Jamie Alexiak in Seattle. Oh yeah. At six boy. foot seven, 257. Yeah. But you know, that's, that, that is a few pounds heavier, but he's not in your conference. He's not in your division. Like he's not, he's not even in the East. So I just, uh, when it comes to matching up against teams in the Atlantic and in the East, like you, you have the biggest player. 
I just think like if you look directly at the Bruins competition, the Florida Panthers just won the Stanley Cup. So everybody's kind of looking uphill at them, but they're in your division and there's an inevitable uh, course clash, if you will, at some point, if if the Bruins kind of want to get to where they want to go, at, at least in theory, right? Anybody can get upset or, or have a down year, I suppose. But do you like you just if you picture the Bruins playing the Panthers or anybody really, but let's just use the Panthers because they they are the standard of physicality and skill and, and, and determination. Matthew Kachuk, Sam Bennett, like when Sam Bennett is on the ice, you're like, oh, he's going to he can steamroll a Bruin at any time. He'll bounce off Zadorov. Kachuk will bounce off Zadorov, and and I just feel like that's one example of a few players on a on a cup winning team. But the Bruins, like I said, I think that it's very evident that in the playoffs to win four series in, in the NHL to win a Stanley Cup, you do have to have you do have to have size. It, it it does it does matter that time of year. There's no way around it, and I just think that it was necessary for the Bruins to get a guy on the back end that brings that fear, that intimidation, that in-your-face style uh, that Zadorov brings. And as I mentioned, I just think that they did it where they weren't sacrificing skill to bring in size. I think they got all of it. And yeah. I think I think Max Jones has the potential to um, uh, relatively, to his standards, pop off offensively in Boston. I think that uh, Mark Kostelik can also pop off like, and when I say pop off, I mean like in like their, their roles. Like I think they can have, they can put up career years, I think in Boston career numbers offensively as well. Yeah. And I think that the, like the comparison that you have to make is, you know, are they better on a, in a fourth line role than Lauko is? Cause Lauko is who you lose. He's who goes out. Boquist goes out. But I think Lauko is really the guy that they would have been competing for, uh, for ice time with. Can either of them finish better than Lauko? Can either of them do uh, their role better than Lauko? And I think that, you know, there's there's a good chance that they can. And you have that that bottom six depth that you're looking for. My main thing is, and, and just in regular conversation, like I'll be sitting at a bar or whatever, and people are like, well, how are they going to figure out what to do with the hole that Jake DeBrusque left? And I think that that's really the biggest, like, uh, question mark. Besides Swayman, which which I said off the top isn't really a question mark at all. Um, so the biggest question mark becomes where is the top six? Like who fills the top six role? Um, and we've and we've had people tweet at us about Lysel, and we've had people tweet at us about and and Scott actually has mentioned this before. Maybe that's a role that you fill at the trade deadline, and you don't worry about it as long as you make the playoffs. Uh, as long as you're set up in playoff contention with the, the roster that you have, maybe it's not something you need until the trade deadline. And I, I just think it's, it's, I would much rather have that be a question mark top six wing than number one center or uh, solidifying your blue line the way that they have. Like I, I like to, to your point, Bridget and Scott mentioned it a, a, a few episodes back. Like, yeah, like, they they can they're gonna try to fill it internally in the short term by committee and see if anybody can really grab that job and excel, and if not, yeah, like you you can find that guy as the year goes on. Well, and and I think, it, you know, because like there's gonna be a lot of teams looking for wings. Like I'm not saying it's gonna be easy to do that. Um, because I was thinking of, about this because the Athletic put out an article today. It was like one of those staff articles where everyone kind of contributes and it was the the biggest hole remaining on every team um, after the first week of free agency. And, and that was obviously the Bruins was scoring wing, but it was like, it seemed like maybe 20 teams. It was like top nine forward, top nine forward, top nine forward. It's like, everyone's kind of, everyone's sort of feels a little short there. And it's like, well, we're mm -hmm. just going to need someone to step up. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then some of them were right shot defensemen, left shot defensemen, whatever. But the thing about like if that is your need at the deadline is there's probably several different styles of player who could, you know, provide some offensive punch. Whereas I think it's a little different to be like, you know, like Nikita Zadorov, you're not just filling a spot on the roster. Like it's not just, Oh, we need a left shot defenseman, go get whoever's available. It was all those things you mentioned off the top, Brian, about like, the attitude he brings and the way he plays. And like they identified a specific skill set that 
they saw in him that they felt they needed. And like, that's just harder to do at the deadline to be like, we want to find a guy who fills this position and brings this skill set and plays this way. And it's like, well, you know, that guy just simply might not be a, like, never mind being able to get him, but he simply just might not be available. Cause like, you've really kind of narrowed down on like, sort of really narrowly defining what you're looking for. And if Nikita Zadora filled that and he's a free agent, you get him now. And then you try to figure out what, what you need to do, whether it's, you know, someone internally stepping up or you go address that at the deadline. But like, you know, it, you see teams every year that, you know, find a, a top middle six wing and you're like, yeah, I don't really know if that's going to be a fit. And you kind of just figure out a way to make it work. It's like they're going to, if they're a good enough player, they're going to fit somewhere. Like when the Panthers got Vladimir Tarasenko, you looked at that. Like, I know I looked at that and I was like, he doesn't really seem like a fit there. Like they, they're clearly a team that's committed to defense and Vladimir Tarasenko generally doesn't play much defense. So how does that work? It's like, well, it works fine because he bought in for three months or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he was first line, sometimes second line, sometimes third line. And he didn't need to be a star. So, you know, like whoever you're getting at the deadline, unless something has happened to like Pasternak and Marchand and even Lindholm, like they don't need to be a star. They just need to be, I don't know, your fifth score. And like you, you should be able to find that if you still need to. Yeah, and I think one thing about Zadorov that's different than guys that you like if you had targeted this at the deadline or you know what I mean? Like if you, if you didn't prioritize this right now and you're looking for it later, he's kind of a unicorn in a way. Like we just talked about, like with his size is his, you know, his, his actual weight in the way that he plays, you can't really find around the league. It's, it's very, uh, he's, he's at the highest end, uh, of what he does, right? Like he's somebody that you, you need to sign him. Uh, when he's available because, and, and I'm pretty sure the Bruins went after him at this trade deadline because uh, he got moved at this trade deadline. And you know that Don Sweeney was making calls about him. Same with Elias Lindholm. I think these are two players that have been on Don Sweeney's radar for a while. They weren't able to make the deals uh, until this point. Uh, but the, these are guys that, and, and talking about Zadorov specifically, that are that he's harder it's harder to come by a player like him uh so mm. you, you have to do it when you can and and you know he was if he got signed by another team he probably wasn't going to become available for you know another four years five, you know what i mean like he's he's not mm. coming available uh anytime soon and he is a unicorn in that way that um try to find a a more physical bigger guy than him is going to be hard to come by and you're not drafting that kind of guy you're not uh, you know, I don't, there's nobody in the Bruins system that fits that role right now that can do it the way he does. So that's why it was yeah. important for them to target him. Yeah. He's a very unique NHL player. Um, certainly kind of like one of a kind as it pertains to his size and what he's able to bring in all, yeah. in all areas, uh, to Scott's point earlier about, um, like uh, the athletic article he mentioned another, uh, exercise that listeners and fans can do if you ever have time and you're interested is go to dailyfaceoff.com they have by team a drop down box we can look at their line combinations and their d pairs they have and for those visual learners it's 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 aesthetically pleasing because it's just the they have the jersey numbers with the guy's name and it's the depth charts right there and if you do that drop down box and you go team by team which i unapologetically did a few days ago, you'll, you'll see that every single team in the NHL has a roster right now where you're looking at a few areas, at least one area, if not more, even the contenders where you're like, Oh, that's those line combinations. Don't I would take the Bruins over that line over those lineups. Like even, even the defending Stanley cup champion, Florida Panthers, like they have, they have uh, Brandon Montour, gone like that's a that's a pretty big role um and and some other pieces that they couldn't keep like every team has a hole entering october and it's about what teams can string together the best regular season and then have their management buy into the product 
closer to the playoffs. And and then, yeah, like the trade deadline, uh, like Tarasenko is an example, right? Players are very reluctant to go to a team at the deadline and not buy in. You're going into a locker room where the, the, that team has battled together all year. You don't have, you know, uh, a pot to piss in if you don't want to, you know, do what the team's asking of you. So, um, yeah, I just think I, I think the Bruins right now, like, yes, they have a need, but everybody does is my point. And uh, yeah. they'll find a way to to get through. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm I'm looking at the Panthers right now, and their second D pair, because they also lost Oliver Ekman Larson, is Dmitry Kolikov and Nico Mikola. Both good players were important in this run, but like that's you know, Kolikov's been a third pairing guy his whole career. Maybe Nate Schmidt, who who I, I like I liked that signing for them. Like they just took a kind of a cheap veteran flyer, and I'm like that's basically what they did with Ekman Larson last year. That makes a lot of sense to me, but you know, that's not, that's a second pairing that like leaves something to be desired. Once you take Montour out of there, um, they lost their entire fourth line. They lost Tarasenko, as I mentioned, um, you know, it looks like they're going to have to right now. This has Mackie Samuskevich penciled in, uh, who's, you know, played some NHL games, but is mo- pretty much a rookie. I don't know if he technically still qualifies. I'm, assuming he does. Um, but you know, talented player, um, out of Michigan, like, you know, again, it's like sort of the same thing as myself. It's like, he's going to get a shot, but you're going to see if he's ready. So, um, you know, that their fourth line going to look really familiar to Bruins fans right now. It has Jesper Boquist and Tomas Nosek on it. Yeah. So, you know, like again, good players. You liked what they did here, but that's a very, that's very different than sort of the, the attitude setting that you got from, you know, Nick Cousins, Ryan Lomberg, even, you know, a veteran leader like Arcoso, like. No, I mean, remember the criticisms, the criticisms that Bruins fans and and this podcast had about no sick and Boquist was that they're not a tough, like those are not tough players. Those are, those are players that are, what you're looking from for no sick is to be defensively sound and and win face-offs like that is not a tough looking fourth line as it's currently constituted for them which they normally roll out four lines that can be can be physical or uh are going to beat you with their skills so uh it's it it's a the point that you guys are both making you're we're mostly talking about the the biggest competition for boston as uh, the team that knocked them out of the playoffs the last two seasons but um I did want to, and another thought that came through my head, uh, even before we're talking about, you know, you know, the, the rest of the holes around the league was who could fill the Bruins hole that DeBrusque left. And, and there's, there are ideas that you, that you can have that are, you know, they're not terrible. Uh, if you look at what the Bruins were working with last year, maybe Morgan Geeky fills a top six role, right? Like he has at times, is he the ideal person to do it? No, but you already have him under contract. He has mixed in on the first line, second line. Uh, is that higher in the lineup than he should be playing? Probably, but that's somebody that can fit that hole. And, and, you, and you look at other people that maybe are are longer shots for it, but Matt Patra, he, he could end up playing wing on, on the second line. That's not completely out of the realm of possibility. And we've also had... A lot of people bring up Fabian Lysel, who I would say would be the longest shot to fill that hole. But if he somehow is able to pull off a strong preseason and uh, crack the lineup, maybe he makes a push for it. Uh, I think, like I said, I think he's the longest shot. But if you look at the players that might be able to fit there, uh, you even Trent Frederick comes to mind. Uh, there, there are guys that you might have to force higher in the lineup than they had been previously but maybe when you give them a chance that they, they make it work. So there, it's not like there's no one there to push up. And then maybe you just have to fill in a third line or a fourth line role. If somebody works out there. Uh, just to throw in another name that somebody mentioned to me online is Justin Brazo. You, you never know what he could end up emerging as now, obviously, as I say that now on July 8th, I think that that's obviously an inappropriate slot to put him in. But I, I'm I'm trying to find it because last year I looked it up. But I think I think Justin Brazo was on an 82 game pace last regular season. 
um, for like 35 points or something like that. Um, or maybe, maybe his totality of games as a Bruin, if it was an 82 game pace, like 35 points or something like that. If Max Jones and Mark Kostelik and Johnny Beecher make up a fourth line, like, and Brazo pops off, like you just, you just never know. Cause maybe Lysel and Merkulov aren't in a position to win those spots. And maybe the Bruins want size to protect Martian. Like you just never know. Right. And then it, it could just be a committee by committee situation until you get to uh, a point in the season where maybe you can, you can add outside the system. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to bring up quickly, guys, before we maybe also, move on, move on. on Brazo, while you're there, like when I wrote, when I did a feature on him last year, I talked to his junior coach, Stan Butler. And the quote that like I ended the article with that he told me was, you know, I, he said, I don't think he's going to be a fourth liner for long. He always finds a way to move up and keep getting better and exceed expectations. So like he has done that at every level. I'm I'm with you that. Like I think it, you know, I don't think he's gonna be at their second line right wing. But could he move up to the third line and stick there? Definitely. Do do I rule anything out? I don't think so. Only because yeah. like he he does have this history where he has pretty consistently just exceeded expectations at, at every turn. So um, you know, even just sticking in the NHL making the NHL at all last year exceeded expectations. Sticking and, and putting up some decent numbers exceeded expectations. So and I I did I did find I did find uh what I was talking about. So uh he had six goals, three assists for nine points in 23 games to start his NHL career, regular season and postseason combined, which was an 82 game pace of approximately 21 goals, 11 assists for 32 points. And you know, my commentary after that was like, if he can grow into a 40 plus point player with that size, um, you know, look out that that could be something. So yeah, you just, you just never know. And <laughs> we talk about the door off was his, his size and his, his size and skill combination was a very welcomed addition to the Bruins last year. Yeah. But and he, and he goes like, if you give him more ice time and you, and you, and he does what he did with the Bruins in that small sample size, like you mentioned last year, one of the main things that the Bruins were lacking and one of the roles that he filled was going to the net. Like he mm. is a net front guy that can clean up pucks in front of the net, take the puck to the net. Uh, defenders have a hard time taking it away from him when he drives the net because of his size and his strength. So if you are able to get him to do that more often or like give him more minutes and he succeeds at doing those things that he already did well when he came up, you could see the numbers going up for him and him filling that role because he becomes, you know, if you can polish him off, like he becomes a power forward that can drive the net and, and take away the goalie's eyes and, and do all of those really like uh, basic things that, that help you win. By the way, on, on Lysel, since you brought him up, Bridget, um, I, you know, I, I will say it was interesting to hear Ryan Mujanel talk about him at development camp um, because obviously everyone's aware of the comments Mujanel made in December where he kind of, you know, just publicly called him out, said he wasn't buying into a team game, um, was much more positive talking about him last week and said, you know, he, he did buy in in the second half and, that his, his all around game has really grown. He's seen him, you know, start to understand the value of defense and like all that. Um, and he said he, he does expect him to push. And another thing on myself that like I started thinking about, and I was like, I think I like this idea is, you know, how like the start of training camp, especially Montgomery's done this. He always puts like young players with veterans. Like he kind of mixes, he, he doesn't start training camp with the lines that he, thinks it's going to be opening night. He'll kind of mix and match. Well, one thing I want to see is from the start of training camp and for like a couple of preseason games, put Lysel on Marchand's line. And if you want to put Coyle with them, because that could be the line, fine. But basically just staple Fabian Lysel to Brad Marchand and have Marchand ride his ass. Like Jake DeBrus talked about how Marchand did that with him when he kind of first moved to Marchand's line. Like Mar Marchand would basically just let him know like, Hey, you're not practicing hard enough today. Like have, have Martian do that with Lysel and he's the captain. And I think he'd be totally willing to do that. And if you get to the end of training camp and preseason and like 
you, you haven't seen it from my cell and Martian hasn't gotten through to him, then that that's all the look I need to give it. Like, I don't even need to give it regular season time at that point, but I would just like to see like what that produces. Send this take immediately to Jim Montgomery, because I could not agree with you more that Brad Marshan is somebody that could kick his game to another level and give him perspective that he might not have had before, because this is a, a veteran in the league that uh, it's hard to outwork Brad Marshawn. So if somebody's taking a shift off and, and Brad Marshawn is there, uh, he's going to call him out. And, but a lot of the times, because you, you know that going into it, you don't take shifts off and you do elevate your game uh, and you maybe uh, find a way to be a better team player. And that that's what Marshawn could bring out of him. And that's that's the natural, as we were just talking about, and what can we'll continue to talk about, I think, at, at times throughout this year. Like that's the natural opening right now in the Bruins roster is is alongside Coyle and Marsh, and we believe on that right side. Um so I don't mean to gloss over Elias Lindholm. I just think that you know we have plenty of time to discuss his impact in the Bruins as we grow go throughout the summer. And um, but I do want to jump back quickly to Zadorov and the what you guys think that that could mean for, I don't want to call it a bounce back year, but maybe like a, 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 um, a resurrection of like the older version of Charlie McAvoy. He, he seems like a player who's just younger been, version of Charlie McAvoy. Yeah. He, just, <laughs> he, he seems while his, you know, defensively, he's still really, really strong. He just seems to have been a little bit worn down the last couple of years. And obviously the year before last, he started the season on the shelf from off season surgery. And he just, so much is expected of him. He's supposed to carry so much. Do you guys think that according to Don Sweeney, it sounds like they might want to stick the door off on McAvoy's left. You go from playing with an undersized skilled skater and Matt Grizzly, who McAvoy had great chemistry with as advanced analytics would tell you, but you go from the, the complete opposite. You go from, Grizzlick, who is in McAvoy's shadow, literally because of the, the size difference, to McAvoy now in Zadorov's shadow. And if you think that we've talked about Zadorov's presence, the presence of Zadorov allows McAvoy to play larger than he is and pick and choose his spots better and also just maybe take some bit more chances offensively because you got a six foot six monster that is on your left side that can cover some ice for you and, and play that, that role of the big physical presence and, you know, not too dissimilar um, to the style of player that obviously Zidane Chara provided McAvoy on that left side, which is, a, you know, big towering presence that um, is there to back you up at all times uh, during, after, and before whistles. What, what, what's the impact that Zadorov can have on McAvoy's game going forward if they do play together? Yeah, it, if it clicks, then it's kind of the ideal match. Like, like you said, like it, it should free McAvoy up. Like Don Sweeney said, it should save McAvoy from from some hits. And and I also think it takes some pressure off McAvoy to, you know, how many times last year do, were we like someone has to set the tone physically, and it's like, well, McAvoy will go and try to throw a big hit, but it seemed like it always kind of came had to come from him well now if he's paired with someone who like fully embraces that job then obviously McAvoy's still going to play physically he's still going to throw hits but that pressure of needing to be the guy who always sets that tone that's off so all of it should free his game up a little more and allow him to to get more involved offensively which kind of you know really came and went last year um so yeah, it you can see how it works, but you know it's also it's by no means a slam dunk that it's going to like Nikita Zadorov is not he's not a bona fide top pairing player. If if he was, he would have gotten eight million on the open market, not five. Um, you know he's generally been a solid second third pairing guy. So that doesn't mean he can't be paired with McAvoy because you know how guys pair at five on five is different than what their total minutes are going to end up being like 
you know, Mac, McAvoy Grizzly was a good five on five pair, even though Grizzly sometimes is only playing 17 minutes a night. So it can work. It's just, it, it's, it's not a slam dunk, but the path is there for it to greatly help McAvoy. Well, is Mac Grizzly a bona fide top pair guy? No. So that's who he was paired with. Like, is Mason Laura a bona fide uh, top pair guy? Not yet. No. So, what like, about, the one guy, about, the only What, what other... about Derek Forbert when, when they had him with McAvoy? <laughs> Good point, Brian. Uh, no, so, like, we're, we're talking about guys that get elevated because of chemistry. And, and if you find the right fit, you find the right fit. Like, if those guys work well together, then that, that's just how it is. And it doesn't matter if he's been that guy that leaves the, leads the pair or has been there in the past, but uh, there's been plenty of guys that McAvoy has played with that were not previously top pair guys that, or, or wouldn't be top pair guys on other teams. Uh, and Matt Grizzly, he just left the Bruins to go to the Penguins for bottom pair money. Like th- this isn't, uh, and it, I don't see this as an issue that he, that he hasn't been, uh, one of those guys in the past because it just all depends on how they work together. And if you know if you watch it and it, it doesn't go well, then you can always move it around because he would fit next to. I mean, think about how big a, a Zadorov Carlo pair would be, or you know, it, you could do that as well, and it, it'd be perfectly fine. So I think wherever he fits best for you after after getting a good sample size, that's fine. But like you mentioned, Sweeney. His whole idea when he made this move seems like it was intended to be a, a partner for McAvoy. I just I just love the makeup of this blue line. Their combination of size and skill and uh, ability to create offense and obviously defend. I just love it and, and and their ability to compete. I think from McAvoy, you got McAvoy, Zadorov, Carlo, Lindholm. Um, you know, Lori as an emerging, obviously, defenseman, uh, Andrew Peak, Watherspoon's looking like your seventh guy. It's just like one through seven, and we could discuss um, at a later date, you know, depth beyond that. But, you know, those seven guys, I just love, I love that group. And <laughs> um, despite some uh, pretty um, uh, insane rumors about uh, Carlo being traded for Truba and, and Matt Rempe. I don't know if you guys saw those. And Johnny, yes, Beecher. I did. Someone <laughs> texted me this, and they were like, "Is this true?" I was like, "No, <laughs> no, it's uh, <laughs> crazy." So, no. So aside from aside from that, I uh, yeah, I love I love what this group has to bring. Uh, yeah, and and you know who who else is a door off frees up? Hampus Lindholm and Mason Lorai on the, on that left side because Zadora was going to get. A lot of tough assignments and and a lot of D zone starts. He always has in his career. Um, you know, I thought I thought Hampus Lindholm could handle the role the Bruins gave him last year, where he was buried with defensive zone starts. But it also led to criticism because his offensive game didn't get to where people expected it to be. And I think I think what you saw is that Hampus Lindholm, you know. Two years ago, at the start of the season when McAvoy was out, we saw that he can step up offensively and put up some points if he's in offensive situations. I think last year we saw that he can play in a defensive shutdown role and be effective, but don't expect him to also put up points then. And I think now you're just going to be able to get a better balance for him. Like It's not going to go back to you're the number one offensive defenseman like he was during that stretch when McAvoy was out. Like That's not going to happen. But I think you can not have him buried with defensive zone starts the way that he was last season. And you just free that up a little, get him in a few more offensive situations per game. And I think you'll see the points go up. At least you should. Like, that is how it should work. And Lori, now you also don't have to throw right into top, top four assignments. Like, now, again, regardless of where he actually lines up, like, on the depth chart, he can be used in offensive situations, offensive zone faceoffs against third and fourth lines instead of top lines. And like, I think that's going to be good for him too, as he now hopefully goes through a full 82 game NHL season um, and really sticks. Like could Lori have handled a, a top four role in 20 minutes a game right away? Possibly. I mean, he certainly looked like he was capable of it in the playoffs, 
but now he doesn't have to. Like now that pressure's off. Now some nights he might only play 16 or 17 minutes and other nights he might go 20 plus. And like, you just don't, you're just not relying on him being able to handle that top four role right away. Okay, guys. So I think maybe we can, before we get out of here, just quickly touch base and circle back to Jeremy Swayman and, and the, uh, the situation where we all, we all are in agreement here. It's a matter of, um, when not if so as it pertains to what the holdups could be guys is it just is it just a classic case of a you know an agent being stubborn and trying to get his client the best possible deal and and the gm also trying to get the best deal for the team but both sides know they're going to come to an agreement um yeah i mean it's hard to say i i think both sides know there is going to be a deal eventually but you know i i don't know like what I don't know is, are they still a part on the money? Like, you know, is are the Bruins at seven and a half and he's at eight and a half and there's still work to do there? Or are they are they close on the money, but now it's the details of bonuses and the no trade clause and what that's going to look like and like and all that stuff. So, you know, they could be really close and, and just working out details or there could still be real work to do in terms of the the money and kind of bridging that gap because I, I would understand the case on both sides. Like, you know, if Swayman is looking at and saying, Ilya Sorokin makes eight and a half, and I've been pretty comparable to him, so I should get eight and a half. I'm in my prime. And if the Bruins look at and say, well, UC Saros just got seven seven five, and he's proven himself as a guy who can – start 60 plus games in three straight years and you never started more than 43. Like I would also understand that case. So I could see there being work to do there. Um, it, it's definitely encouraging that neither side picked arbitration. That would have, would have been a bad sign. It would have put a hard deadline on when they would have needed to get a deal negotiated by, because those arbitration hearings are coming up July between July 20th and August 4th is when they're all going to be scheduled. So you like you really would have now been in a rush to sit down at the table and hammer something out because the arbitration hearing might have been as soon as two weeks away. So, um, you know, now there is no real hard deadline. Like everyone would like to see it get done sooner than later. But in theory, like as long as it's done before the season, you're, you're fine. Um, it, I, it shouldn't drag on that long, but at least now you're not under the gun where it's like, Oh crap, we have two weeks or we're going back through this awful arbitration process. Yeah, and, and I, I do feel like I, I feel like money is one of the holdups, but I also think that uh, based on Swayman's relationship with Linus Allmark and seeing some of the other, uh, like seeing Elias Lindholm's no trade deal that, you know, or stipulation that he has in his contract. Like, I feel like maybe the, the no trade uh, list or exemption or, or what have you, like, is it a full no trade or is it a half or, um, or nothing at all is probably a holdup too, because the Bruins saw how it, it can tie you up. And, and, you know, obviously good GMs knew that before they even had to deal with something like uh, Lena Salmark, but, he's, he's definitely having to weigh that maybe more than he thought in the past. And, uh, there, there are minor things that could be big, a big deal for someone like Jeremy Swayman. Does he want to have full control of his future uh, in terms of where he can go, uh, being able to stop a trade and, and things like that. So, uh, things that might not seem important or, uh, they might seem like, you know, lesser, like lower on the list of importance for, for things that, regular fans think about uh, are really important to someone who wants to stay in the same place, uh, be part of an organization, can have control over their future because that's, those are life-changing things for guys. So I feel like maybe that could be one of the holdups as well uh, because both sides are going to want different things in that case as well. And, and like I just mentioned, we, we haven't talked much about the allies Lindholm, no trade and uh, you know, how long that lasts for him. Cause it's not his entire contract, but, uh, that that could be another holdup for him. And the only other thing I wanted to mention about Swayman 
uh, before maybe we quickly get back to development camp, because I did have one thing to say about that, is how much cap space the Bruins have left, uh, which is just over $10.2 million. So uh, if he signs for eight and a half, there actually is a kind of a big difference between uh, uh, that and what you could add. Uh, like a, a, a $2 million player and a $3 million player are, are different. Uh, you know, those are different caliber people. So uh, there people talk about a team deal. I, I don't really think that we're going to see that necessarily from Swayman because I think he's upset about what happened last season and uh, knows what his worth is, but they're, they're, that's another reason why the Bruins are still trying to pinch pennies is because the caliber of player you can get if you get Swayman to sign for a million dollars less is different. Yeah, yeah. I, I honestly I honestly don't even think there's going to be another addition after Swayman. I mean, maybe something really small, but like once you fill in the roster and get your 13 forwards, seven defensemen, you know, 22 men, 23 men roster, whatever you decide to go with, like they're going to pretty much be at the cap or a million, a million and a half away. So, you, you know, you want to have some money left over going into the season anyways, so you can you can make some moves, you can move guys up and down and all that stuff. Like, my guess is, other than maybe like a PTO for training camp or something, I don't really think you're going to see another free agent signing. Um, unless it's just like someone's lingering out there and it's just a deal that's too good to pass out. But if you look at the list of who's left, like, that play is really not out there, you know, pretty, pretty much like the top 50 free agents have all been signed at this point. So has, has Joe Pavelski announced a, a retirement officially? I, yeah, I think so. He has. Okay. Um, so yeah, look, I mean, Swayman's going to get done. Uh, it's just a matter of when, and I saw a, a poll on, on Twitter recently. I forget what account it was. So. Unfortunately, I can't give a shout out, but um, there was a there was a survey conducted by like a couple thousand NHL fans. Um, no bias or anything like that, just fans across the world, or whatever. And Jeremy Swayman was ranked as the the fourth best goaltender in the league behind. I think I think the list went Shesterkin at one, Vasilevsky at two, Connor Hellebuck at three, and then Jeremy Swayman at four. So we all knew how good Swayman was, but. Now everybody knows how good Jeremy Swayman is. And so, yeah, he's going to, he's going to get paid and uh, Scott's right. It could be, people are always like, what's the hold up? Just get it done. Give him the bag. And, and Scott, you're right to bring up, like there's a lot more at play in contract negotiations than simply uh, value and term. And there, there are a lot of details that go into it that could be holding things up as well. And just, yeah, you know, T crossing like and I dotting. Right. And like what that no move clause looks like that affects the money too. Cause if you're going to get, you know, if you're going to get full no trade clause for like the entirety of the deal or for six of the eight years or whatever, then you, you gotta, you probably gotta leave a little bit of money on the table. And, and most guys are willing to do that for the security and the control. Um, you know, I saw, I don't know if you guys watched Lena Selmark's interview with a uh, Pete and DJ on what, what chaos. Um, Sorry, excuse me. But um, they asked him, like, you know, would you, if you went back, like, knowing that you ended up getting traded anyways, would you have taken more money and, like, left the no trade clause? And he, he was like, no. Like, there was a reason I wanted it. There was a, you know, I, there were teams I definitely wanted to cross off. And he said he wouldn't have traded that for, for more money. So I think that's how a lot of players feel. Like, you know, if someone was okay with no no move clause at all. Like Bruins would probably give him 10 million a year, but like, that's not going to happen. Like no, no player at that caliber or I, I guess very, very few will take no protection. Like that, that's just almost unheard of to nowadays in the NHL. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would take less money for uh, to sign a contract where I couldn't get fired or, or moved to a different city that I didn't want to be. <laughs> Like I will, I would take that. I, I completely understand that. Uh, we all have personal lives that we, you know, we're comfortable where we're comfortable and we don't want to be told what to do. Personally, <laughs> I don't like being told where to go or what to do ever. So I completely understand that, that part of it. 
Is there anything else you wanted to say about Swayman or can we quickly I, go? I actually did. I negotiated a no trade clause into our last uh, skate pod negotiations. So when good was luck that? getting rid of me, guys. Yeah. When was your last skate pod negotiation? Uh, it was it was after the season. I was I was a restricted free agent this season. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess I wasn't. I don't know. I got to renegotiate. I think maybe, but yeah. but as of right now, you know, I'm I'm, locked, I'm still I'm still locked into a into a long term team friendly deal. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm still I'm 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 here for a little bit. Yes, yeah, so I feel like I'm always a free agent. You know, anybody want to pay me more? If you're listening, I'm just trying to set the culture. You know, like Marshan, <laughs> just you know, allow. It. I mean, if I'm if I'm taking a team friendly, everybody's gonna take a team friendly. You know, so yeah, no, but, it's yeah. true. Uh. So I wanted to get into just a few thoughts on development camp uh, based on your opening shift, Scott. I jotted a few things down because I, I just, you know, I, these are just questions I have. Uh, and really it's just some points to make about Letourneau. You said that he was, you know, losing some battles in drills. Uh, yeah. and he was he, also winning some, by the way. Like I just, yeah. just so people... Just the no one thinks like, oh my god, he lost every battle. Yeah, no, no of course not, of course not. And these, these are just things that you you are looking at with a critical eye. So you're noticing mistakes because you're looking at it with a critical eye. But uh, and you said some of his technical skating was, you know, there were some mistakes there. But what I'll say about those two things is, those are things that are with the right coaching that are easy to fix, right? Like technical skating skills. Those are those are things you can practice by yourself. Like you don't even need to be with a team to do that. Like you can practice that over the summer, you, you, doing technical skating, and uh, those are those are just drills, right? Those are not hockey IQ. Those are not size. Like that doesn't change the way that he is and and how he can score. Like you mentioned earlier, like his his shooting ability. Those are the things that are harder to fix than, uh, you know, finding ways to to skate better or, uh, you know, win certain battles. Like those are the more teachable things. Yeah, for sure. And like, and a lot of kids at 18, even the ones in the draft, even some guys who go pretty high, haven't really worked very much with a professional skating coach yet. Um, you know, so like as, and I don't know if Laterno had, I think he has a little bit, but like as he does that more, like that's gonna get better. Um, so yeah, it's not. Look, as we said right away, like he is a bit of a project, and he's gonna require patience. So like, don't expect him to be one and done, and then centering the second line next year. It's probably not gonna happen. So you know, like give it, give him a couple years of BC. Let's see what happens. To me, like as long as you see steady growth. Like, I don't think he, I would be very surprised if he comes into BC this year and dominates and puts up a huge point total like some of BC's freshmen did last year, right? Like, if you're looking at last year that they had that all freshman line of Will Smith, Gabe Perot, and Ryan Leonard, and they all put up massive point totals and set records. So you think, like, oh, well, that's what a first round pick at BC does. Different players, different situations. Like, please don't expect that from Dean Letourneau. If he does that, then that's amazing. Then he is way ahead of where I think he is and where a lot of people think he is. Um, but it's going to take a little more time with him. Like he's he's a little raw. He's coming from Canadian prep school. He wasn't in the U.S. development program playing in a bajillion international tournaments and playing against college teams during the season like the U.S. under-18 team does. Like he, he didn't do that, you yeah. know? So like – it's going to take a little bit and then that's fine. Um, yeah, it's going to take a little bit, but this is also, this is an opportunity for him that he hasn't had before where if he can, uh, if he can take advantage of it and can raise himself to, to a level, it's like, it's going to be a big jump. Like for, for guys that were playing in the U S national development team, they were playing colleges. I broadcast a game where they were playing Yale and they were, they, they beat, some of the best colleges when they play like Perot, uh, Smith and Leonard were on a line that was a first line for the U S national development team before they even went to college. That was beating some of the best players in, in that were already, you know, older than, than them in college 
it's kind of crazy the win percentage that that team had and, and that the U.S. national development team does have. They're, they're exhibition games, sure. So some teams are trying out different combinations. They're trying to tinker, and it's not a, it's not a hugely serious game to them. But the way that they that they already had this experience against older players, bigger players, college coached players, mm. uh, players who had had longer time to develop is different. So maybe you see a big jump from him in college because it's the first chance that he has to get that experience. And, you know, there's there's plenty of, of different ways it could go, but that's the optimistic yeah. way to look at it is he has this chance to get up to speed to some of those guys. Yeah, I, I love the fact that he's going to the NCAA. Love the fact that he's going to BC because – yeah, like the one of the pros to playing Canadian juniors is obviously a schedule that kind of has a similar workload to the NHL as far as uh, volume of games. Um, and yeah, there's some some real high end skill in Canadian juniors. But the NCAA, as you just alluded to, Bridget, you're you're playing against the majority of guys are probably 20 to 23 years old. Right. Um, the true freshman is a rarity. And I think that uh, Letourneau is going to learn a lot uh, playing against uh, you know, grown men. And even though it's still college, it's you're you're 22, three and in, in the hockey world, that's your, your body's pretty well developed. And can he go from 214 pounds to 230 pounds in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, 24 months? Absolutely. You know, to Which maybe is another 34 easy, or five. That, that's another very controllable thing to do that with current, like like modern uh, understanding of just working out and and uh, nutrition, can, you can do like I. Uh, that's something that Matt Potter was working on. That's something that plenty of guys have worked on. And and if you really just uh, you know buckle down and and do what you need to do, a a good trainer, a good nutritionist can can get you to that point. Uh, where you do put that weight on and then, you know, you, you, you bulk and then you cut and you, you find the right body weight. And, uh, for you, that's not awkward, but that's another very easily fixable thing that you can do away from the rink, like, mm -hmm. or away from gameplay. Uh, so yeah, and, and it could help him and, and it, it probably will, will if, if I he, think I think it's great for him. I think you guys yeah. mentioned he has the raw skill and talent, and now you just got to go and learn the details and 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 mature as a person uh, physically and mentally. Yeah, when you look I, at I even mean, when you look at his face, he just looks so young. You're like, oh my god, this kid! Like, there's there's a lot of things that he can do before he even makes it to the NHL that will that will help him. I mean, there's just a lot there. By the way, he said he said that he's skating with a group back in Ottawa. Um, that usually includes Claude Giroux. So like there's a bunch of NHLers in that group. So that's where he's going to be the rest of summer until he um, gets to BC's campus. And then at BC, it's, it's possible that we end up seeing an all Bruins prospect line. Uh, because if you look at BC's roster, the first line is probably going to be Gabe Perot, Ryan Leonard, and James Haggins. And then Yel Oscar Yelvik and Andre Gasso were already on the same line last year with Cutter Gauthier as their center. So if you figure that's probably like the foundation of their second line, well, what's missing? A center. So if Dean Letourneau can, you know, show that he's ready, like that could end up being BC's second line um, at some point, if not even at the start of the year. Um, by the way, Oscar Yelvig was very good at development camp. He was mm -hmm. one of the standouts, which isn't totally surprising. Like he's, for development camp, he's now a little bit, on the older side going into mm -hmm. his junior year at BC. Um, but he just, he looked really good out there and looked like one of the more confident players um, coming off a really strong season at BC. Yeah. So, you know, he's, he's continues to take good strides and wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if he ends up playing in the NHL at some point, like he's, he's undersized. So he's going to have to fight that battle, but um the, the skill and the work ethic seems to be there and confidence has gone up. Yeah. I think the confidence is there right now. And in the games that I broadcast that he's played in, I he's, I think he scored in every game I broadcast <laughs> that, that he's played in. So uh, you know, I, I've been impressed with what I've seen from him and he's kind of one of the, 
I, we rarely talk about him in our prospect conversations, probably because he's still in the NCAA rather than in Providence. But yeah, I mean, that's a guy that once he finishes college, he may, he, he may, you know, go the full four years and um, we'll see him after that. But yeah, no, he could be, he could be a guy in the future too. All right. You two, uh, not bad, not bad for a midsummer episode where it's about 120 degrees the last few weeks. It feels like, Oh my God, I'm so hot right now, guys. Like you don't even know. Um, <laughs> so hot right now. before, before we sign off, just want to once again, remind listeners that later this week, it will be a, a mailbag episode. So Scott, do you want to plug once again, where, where they can send questions? Sure. At the skate pod on Twitter slash X, uh, skate pod, wei.com for email or wei YouTube page. If you watch us, just comment right on this video, leave us a question there and we'll grab it. And we're looking at send them in by probably Wednesday afternoon to, to guarantee that we get it. All right. Do you got, uh, have anything else before we sign off? All set. No, I think I'm good. All right. And Bridge is muted, so I'll take that as a no. All right. So thank you. <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. <laughs> thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this Gate Podcast. If you want to see more of our videos, visit our playlist. Not in front of a screen? You can listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment.